For a Christian, there can be nothing either more necessary or profitable than the knowledge of Holy Scripture, since in it is contained God's true word, setting forth his glory and also our duty. And there is no truth or doctrine necessary for our justification and everlasting salvation, but that it is or may be drawn out of that fountain and well of truth. Therefore, those who desire to enter into the right and perfect way with God must apply their minds to know Holy Scripture, without which they can neither sufficiently know God and his will, nor their office and duty. And as drink is pleasant to those who are dry and meat to those who are hungry, so is the reading, hearing, searching and studying of Holy Scripture to those who desire to know God or themselves and to do his will. It is only those who are so drowned in worldly vanities that they neither savour God nor any godliness, whose stomachs loathe and abhor the heavenly knowledge and food of God's word. Indeed, that is why they desire such vanities rather than the true knowledge of God. When someone is sick of a fever, Whatever they eat or drink, however pleasant it is, it's bitter to them as wormwood, not for the bitterness of the meat, but for the corruption and bitterness that's in their tongue and in their mouth. In the same way, the sweetness of God's word is bitter, not of itself, but only to those who have their minds corrupted by long custom of sin and love of this world. Therefore, forsaking the corrupt judgment of the fleshly, who care only for the well-being of their physical carcass, let us reverently hear and read Holy Scripture, which is the food of our soul. Let us diligently search for the well of life in the books of the New and Old Testament, and not run to the stinking puddles of people's traditions devised by human imagination for our justification and salvation. For in the Holy Scripture is fully contained what we ought to do and what to avoid, what to believe, what to love, and what to look for from God's hands. In these books we shall find the Father from whom the Son by whom and the Holy Spirit in whom all things have their being and conservation. And these three persons are but one God and one substance. In these books we may learn to know ourselves, how vile and pitiable we are, and also to know God, how good he is of himself, and how he makes us and all creatures partakers of his goodness. We may learn also in these books to know God's will and pleasure as much as for this present time is convenient for us to know. And as the great minister and godly preacher St John Chrysostom says, whatever is required for our salvation is fully contained in the scripture of God. Those who are ignorant may there learn and have knowledge. Those who are hard-hearted and obstinate sinners shall there find everlasting torments prepared by God's justice to make them afraid and to mollify or soften them. The one who is oppressed with misery in this world shall there find relief in the promises of everlasting life to their great consolation and comfort. The one who is wounded by the devil unto death shall find their medicine by which they may be restored again to health. If it's necessary to teach any truth or reprove any false doctrine, to rebuke any vice or to commend any virtue, to give good counsel, 
to comfort or exhort or to do anything that is necessary for our salvation. All those things, says St. Chrysostom, we may learn plentifully from the scripture. There is, says Fulgentius, abundantly enough both for men to eat and children to suck, whatever is appropriate for all ages and for all classes and sorts of people. These books, therefore, ought to be much in our hands, in our eyes, in our ears, in our mouths, but most of all, in our hearts. For the scripture of God is heavenly meat for the soul. The hearing and keeping of it makes us blessed. It sanctifies us. It makes us holy. It converts our souls. It is a light, a lantern to our feet. It is a sure, steadfast, everlasting instrument of salvation. It gives wisdom to the humble and lowly hearts. It comforts and makes glad, cheers and cherishes our conscience. It is a more excellent jewel or treasure than any gold or precious stone. It is more sweet than honey or honeycomb. It is called the best part which Mary chose, for it has in it everlasting comfort. The words of Holy Scripture are called words of everlasting life, for they are God's instrument ordained for that purpose. They have power to convert through God's promise, and they are effectual through God's assistance. Being received in a faithful heart, they always have a heavenly spiritual working in them. They are lively, active and mighty in operation, sharper than a two-edged sword, penetrating even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Christ calls them wise builders who build upon his word, upon his sure and substantial foundation. By this word of God, we shall be judged. For the word that I speak, says Christ, shall judge on the last day. The one who keeps the word of Christ is promised the love and favour of God, and that they shall be the dwelling place or temple of God, of the blessed Holy Trinity. Great affection for the temporary things of this world shall be diminished in whoever is diligent to read this word and in their heart to print what they have read. And great desire for heavenly things that are promised by God in it shall increase in them. There's nothing that so much strengthens our faith and trust in God, that so much keeps up innocence and purity of heart and also of godly life and conversation as continual reading and meditation on God's word. For that thing which by perpetual reading of Holy Scripture and diligent searching of the same is deeply imprinted and engraved on the heart, at length turns almost into nature. And moreover, the effect and virtue of God's word is to illuminate the ignorance and to give more light to those who faithfully and diligently read it, to comfort their hearts and to encourage them to perform that which is commanded by God. It teaches them patience in all adversity, and in prosperity it teaches humility. It teaches what honour is due to God, and what mercy and charity is due to our neighbour. It gives good counsel in all doubtful things. It shows to whom we should look for aid and help in all perils, and that God is the only giver of victory in all battles and temptations, bodily and spiritual. In reading of God's word, it is not the one who is most eager to turn the pages or who can recite it from memory who profits the most. 
but the one who is most turned into it, that is most inspired with the Holy Spirit, most in their heart and life altered and changed into that thing which they read. The one that is daily less and less proud, less wrathful, less covetous and less desirous of worldly and vain pleasures, who, forsaking their old life of vice, increases in virtue more and more. In short, there is nothing that more maintains godliness of the mind and drives away ungodliness than continual reading or hearing of God's word. If it is joined with a godly mind and a good affection to know and to follow God's will. For without a single eye, pure intent and good mind, nothing is counted as good before God. And on the other side, nothing more darkens Christ and the glory of God, nor brings in more blindness and all kinds of vices than does ignorance of God's word.